is the infinite necessarily existing, that is, it's not caused by anything. God was not caused by something else. Unique, there is only one substance in the universe. There is only one substance in the universe. It is God, and everything else that is, is in God. Thus, God or nature is a single, rationally ordered whole, which manifests itself in a variety of ways. And he calls the different ways that God reveals itself, he calls these ways attributes. So what the intellect perceives of a substance, so this one thing, God, what you perceive of God are the attributes. There is no basic or primary attribute. Uh, all attributes express God's infinite perfection completely. Although God is infinite and lacks nothing, he has an infinite number of these attributes. He can express himself in an infinite number of ways. Okay? Now, considered uh, there's oh, human beings because we're limited, right? We are part of God, but we are not God, Spinoza would say. Um, human beings are only aware of two of these special ways that God expresses himself. The two ways are extension, we take space, bodies, matter, right? And thought, ideas. And we all are familiar with both of those, right? We see each other standing here. I have a body, you see my body, you have an idea of my body. So he says human beings can experience the attributes, God, of which they are a part, through ideas and the body. So considered under the attribute extension, God is both all of the space in the universe and everything that fills it, and considered under the attribute of thought, God is the totality of all ideas and knowledge. So God is everything and knows everything. All ideas, like all substance, are contained in God. Quote, the thinking substance and the extended substance are one and the same substance, which is now comprehended or understood through one attribute and now under a different attribute. In addition to the infinite attributes, these ways that God expresses, there's also an infinite number of what Spinoza calls modes, okay? So we have substance, God, and then attributes, the way God is expressed, and then these things called modes. Although there's only one substance, it's not uniformly distributed, right? It can be distributed in different ways. Bodies are concentrations of extended substance that are more dense than the surrounding region. So, according to modern physics, this room where my hand is waving right now isn't actually empty, is it? It's got air in it. And air has got molecules made up of atoms. So nothing is really empty. But me, as a human being, as the mode that I am, considered the, under the attribute of extension, body, I'm a much more dense concentration of substance than air. Nothing is empty, though. God is everywhere. God is everything. Now, human beings are immensely complicated concentrations of substance. As such, when considered under the attribute of extension, when we think of human beings as bodies, our bodies are capable of a wide variety of motions. We can sing, we can dance, we can get F's in class because we slept all day, right? I mean, all the different things that we can do. When considered under the attribute of thought, the complexity of the human being right, that we see in the human body and everything it can do, manifests in the form of the human mind. So just as our body is this immensely complicated thing, so is the human mind. And it's capable of many, many things, many more than, say, a mouse, which is a much simpler body and a much simpler mind. The mind and the body, Spinoza says, are one and the same individual mode, which is now conceived under the attribute of thought, my ideas, or now under the attribute of extension, my body, okay? So, not too weird yet, but are you with me understanding me so far? It's working? Hmm? The last word? Okay, so you can think of my body as very complicated, right? And because I am, my mode that I am can be thought of as a body or as a mind, it's the same thing, there is only one, right? When you consider my very complicated body, I can do all these things. When you consider me as a thinking thing, not as a physical thing, my mind is very complicated and I can do many more things than a mouse, right? Or a clam, or what do you say, a body, right? 
So the, I have a very much more complicated mental life. A much, just like my body is much more complicated than a shrimp body. Right? Good? I'll talk about the parallelism in a minute. Okay, so Spinoza claims that there are no causal connections. This is where it gets weird, as if that wasn't weird enough. He claims that there are no... Dina, you're looking so confused. There are no causal connections between God's attributes. Okay, so let's think about this. Look at a few slides. I realize I'm not keeping up with myself. Here we go. So this third quote, now earlier, the thinking substance are the same substance, now comprehended under one attribute, now under another. The mind and body are the same, right? Now the last thing I'm going to say is this. The body cannot determine the mind to think, nor can the mind determine the body to motion or rest or anything else, okay? So Spinoza's substance monism, there's only one substance. What is it? God, right? And this denial that minds can cause bodies to move or do anything and bodies can cause minds to move, he just says they're parallel. They're the same exact thing considered two different ways. So the body can't determine the mind to think, right? And the mind can't determine the body to move. The order and connection of ideas is the same in the order connections of things. This is the hardest part of Spinoza to understand. We think, you all think, that if you decide with a thought in your mind, I'm going to raise my arm, watch. Right? And we think something mental is causing something physical. Spinoza denies that. Well, it's a long, complicated story. We will, thank you, it's a good question. But he denies the possibility of what we would call free will. Right? So he says, what happens is one thing. Nate moves forward, Nate thinks thoughts, Nate waves his arms around, all of those things happen. They can be understood one way or another way, but it's just one thing happening. The mind didn't make the body move, the body, ow, didn't make me have that, mm, no connection. They're parallel. It's called parallelism. Very long, complicated argument. We can talk about it later. So, for each mode of extension, there exists a corresponding mode of thought. So there's no interaction between modes of different attributes. Very weird and very hard to understand. But I will tell you that there's a long history in religion of people saying, actually, for example, occasionalism. I don't know if anyone's heard of the view occasionalism. That actually human beings don't cause anything. Only God causes anything. What human beings do is give God occasions to express his power. And this is actually even an Islamic thought. In the 12th century, there's a considerable bit of this view that the only power in the universe is God. The only motor that moves anything is God. So in that sense, Spinoza is not that radical. But he is radical in the sense that he says, there's just one you. You want to think about it as the mind? Fine. Or as the body? Fine. But never the twain shall meet. The same thing understood different ways. Now, so far we've talked about things as if they're just objects moving along. Mental objects or physical objects. But Spinoza adds a twist. He describes, he says, everything in God, like God itself, has a striving to persist. Each thing, as far as it can by its own power, strives to persevere in its being. Okay? So in addition to everything existing, what keeps things from just decaying or falling apart? He says everything in nature, every mode, has a power, you might say, of persistence, of resistance, of life force. Right? Why do rocks not crumble into sand? Well, he would say it's their this striving. Even rocks have this striving. They fall back to earth, Aristotle would say. He calls this power, this striving for self-preservation, the conatus, conatus, and identifies it as your essence. Okay? So, he describes the relationship between the mind and the body in terms of this striving that we all have, like this. His parallelism generates the consequence that for whatever one's body, if your body is affected by something external to it, there must exist in the mind simultaneously some corresponding change in your mind. Because again, your mind is going along like this, 
and your body's going along, they're always in parallel. They don't affect each other. They're just going along. So if something affects my body negatively, my mind will also be affected negatively. Right? So what seems like a causal connection, he says, no, it's the same thing being affected. It's Nate, this mode. So when I'm affected and I feel pain, well, guess what? I have an experience, a mental experience and a physical experience, and they are mirrors of each other. One didn't cause the other. They are happening. My mind is negatively impacted. Ouch! And my body is harmed. He claims that when the body is affected in such a way that its power of acting is increased or decreased, there is in the mind a similar experience of your mental, being, your mental power being stronger or weaker. So again, this idea of your body and your mind being affected always in parallel. So mental strength and physical strength go with each other. And similarly, a body in horrible shape cannot, is not going to be connected to a mind in horrible shape. So if you think of it in certain ways, it's not totally crazy. It is weird, though. So what is meant by the power of acting is obscure, but it means the power to preserve in your being. So the mind's striving or power of thinking is equal in one to your body's striving or power of acting. So we imagine those things. I want my mental life to be powerful like I want my body to be strong. Now, I'm going to do a bit more Spinoza. One more difficult chunk that will confuse you, and then we'll move on. I won't talk about the emotions today. Now, this is this section on power and adequacy. Spinoza identifies three kinds of knowledge, and given time constraints, I'll only talk about two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge of the first kind, which he calls opinion and imagination, is what you get from your senses. Okay? And he claims that our experience of the world is, in a sense, misleading. Contrary to what experience might suggest, Spinoza claims that when I perceive an object, the idea I have of that object reveals to me not the object in itself, but the way my body is affected by the object. Okay, let me say that again. So my idea of an object doesn't really show me what the object is out there in the world. What it shows me is how that object, you in this case, affects my body. Now I have a human optical system, right, that takes light frequencies in a certain way. If I were a bat, you know a bat? I would experience looking at him in a radically different way, right? I would have a completely different... So my experience and the bat's experience, they tell us more about our nature than about his nature. Yeah? So my ideas that I get from my senses don't really tell me about the world. They tell me about how the world affects me. They don't tell me the truth. And one of the things we commonly want to say is, no, I don't want your subjective opinion from your point of view. I want the objective facts, right? And Spinoza is talking about that distinction. So what he says is, um, yeah, the ideas which we have, let's see if I have another slide here. Yeah, the ideas we have of external bodies indicate the condition of our body more than the nature of external bodies. Now, it's kind of interesting, right? Seems right. This kind of knowledge is immediate. And re recollect that it's grounded in your experience through your body, through your senses, through your ears, how things feel and smell. He calls it mutilated and confused. Right? It's, it's kind of a mess, what we get from our senses. And we always want more clarity. Right? Knowledge has to be more certain than how it looks from where I'm sitting right now. A little hot, a little parched, right? Now, this first kind of knowledge, he contrasts it with what he calls reason. Surprise, surprise. And reason for him, and he says... Confused and mutilated ideas of opinion and imagination, he calls them inadequate. They're not adequate. They don't tell us the whole story. They're not the truth. And he contrasts these ideas with, surprise, surprise, adequate ideas. So the world, there's two kinds of ideas. The world that you get from experience, which are kind of messy and sloppy, and they're based on where you're sitting, is, right? That's inadequate. It's not the truth. It's not the whole story. And he says, but there's another way of knowing the world. 
in its adequate knowledge. Now, it's really hard to understand what he means by adequate knowledge because most of what we think is always tangled up with our senses, right? We're constantly thinking with our body. And say, no, 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 put how it feels. Just think rationally. Stop acting in your emotions. So I suggest two ways that we might understand what adequate ideas are. First, adequate ideas, true knowledge, unlike inadequate ideas, provide a form of knowledge that doesn't have to do with any individual perspective. Doesn't matter where you're sitting or where you are on earth, or in fact, whether you're God or a human being, if an idea is adequate, it is 100% accurate from all angles, from everywhere. It is the objective truth. Um, so you might say it's almost like an independent of any per particular perspective. So human beings can have a more or less clear understanding of their place in the world, right? And your body is where your body is and you're in the world. But your understanding of that and the world can be sloppy and messy and through your body like a little kid running around the house screaming and yelling. And, or you can, to some degree, have a more adequate understanding. Now, can a human being ever have a perfectly adequate understanding of the world? No. We're always trapped in our bodies. But should we strive to? Do we have a striving, the kanatis, this natural striving? Yes. We do. So a human who has knowledge, right? Only those things that he immediately affects her, right? That person, um, different than mine. Of course it is. They're always in parallel. So as long as we think with our bodies and as long as we use those ideas that we get from our bodies, you and I are never going to, as he would say, agree. So you're right. Yeah, very interesting. So I have a long section here that I'm going to drop because I think it's exciting, but I think you guys are all hot and tired. So I'll go to a very groovy slide, and I'll even stand up and describe it to you. But this is Spinoza in a nutshell, all right? So human beings are modes of God or nature whose mental and physical lives run in complete parallel. We strive in both domains to persist and expand our power. Man, this idea of I'm, I'm striving to persist. I'm, I, when I am oppressed, I am mentally and physically weakened. And my natural power as a being, as a part of God, is to strive to be powerful and healthy. To the extent that we fail to express our power, we're in bondage, he says, to your passions. You are a slave to your body and to a weak mind. And to the extent that we are successful in expressing our kanatas and being powerful, we have adequate ideas, our physical power is also increased, and we enjoy active emotions and joy. And other, notice the emotions that are born of inadequate ideas, hatred, we don't share them. I hate you. But jo the, I, the, I, the emotions that come from adequate ideas, ideas that we can all share, those emotions bring us together. He calls them active emotions. And so we're striving to have an emotional life built of knowledge, of adequate ideas that connects me with all of my brothers and sisters. Okay. Now, I'll do the groovy picture because I think it's cool. Just, I know it's a little weird. So this one substance, God, right? Now, there's all these attributes, right? These things. There's all, who knows what they are? We don't know. But there's only two we're familiar with, right? Extension, bodies, and thought. Now, motion and rest, that's the world of extension. So think of nature as a physical body, motion and rest. The infinite intellect. God knows everything. The world of all ideas. And then as you move down, you get to modes, particular things. You and me. Right? And there's the material universe and the ideas. And when those come together, right, they're running in parallel. The world of ideas, the world of physical things, that thing right there, that's you. That's a mode with a mental and physical expression of God. Individual things. Whew. Does everyone need a... Okay. Good. Are you all right here, Tina? Trying. trying? Okay. So 
now the question is, yes, please. Yes. Because, well, it's a very interesting question. The problem for someone like Spinoza and for a modern physicist, yeah, the question is, look, if this is true, why should I care and do anything? Right? I don't have freedom. I'm not going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. Uh, this really sucks. It's a depressing worldview, right? What you need to understand is the following. If you think of yourself as you think of yourself now, and you say, well, I can only be happy if I'm free and I get what I want. Well, then, of course, this is ridiculous. One of the difficult things about philosophy or religion is that you really have to step out of your comfort zone of how you think of things. Good, bad, right, and wrong. I want to do it. I don't want to do it. All of that stuff, Spinoza would say, would just show you when you made that question, he'd say, thank you for the question. He'd say it, you know, in Dutch. Say, thank you for the question, but it, your question reveals that you haven't understood me, right? Because in asking that question, you think you're free, and you think you know what makes you happy, and you're not free, and you don't really know what makes you happy. And religion tells you the same thing. Yes? You got a lot more than that, but yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, this is the problem, and this is the, pro again, think of Spinoza's ethics like a religion. To understand it, I mean, what if someone said to you, I don't know if you're Christian or Muslim or whatever your religion is, but if someone said to you, well, I mean, why would God put us here, you know, and make all these bad things happen? You know, why is there evil in the world? Now, of course, you guys all can answer that question in a way that makes you comfortable, or at least most of you can, I would assume. But it's a really not an easy question to answer, right? It's, t it's a kind of hard question to answer, even if you think it's true that God is good and God created everything. Why is there evil in the world? Yeah, well, but if, I, if you talk to an atheist from... I don't know, contemporary Netherlands who had their worldview and you tried to explain to them with your story that you've grown up with and believe, it would be extremely difficult. And you'd end up saying, no, you don't understand. You're going to have to read the Quran or the Bible. That's the only way you're going to get it. Yeah. No, no, all I'm saying is the following. To understand Spinoza, just like to understand one of the great Abrahamic texts, right? You have to understand the whole system. So that's why I tried to give you the system. The easy answer is, until you understood Spinoza's system and understood your emotional life the way he describes it, you wouldn't get, get his answer. This isn't satisfying, and I'm not pretending it is. I'm not trying to convert you, right, to Spinozism. I'm not foolish enough, and I'm not a Spinozist either. Oh, no, that's good. I'm happy. You notice I'm smiling. No bro Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do we move? Right. What's the why? What I mean is this, you are caused, like it's like, a ca like dominoes, you know how dominoes fall? In one sense, most of what happens, and this is what physicists tell us too, right? It's dominoes all the way down. So then the question is, and this is what, it means that everything is caused by something that precedes it. So that there is no freedom. If you, I mean, do you think that in a physics lab there's freedom? That atoms move freely, they, have, they make choices and do what they want to do? No, it's cause, effect, cause, effect, according to the laws of nature. Ah, that's a different question. Spinoza says God is an uncaused cause. 
And I think that's a very common religious view. Aristotle said the same thing. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to answer all the questions or defend him. And if we could, I could happily talk Spinoza all day, but I thought I'd burned you guys out. The problem of the, I mean, he says God is infinite. So there, God wasn't caused because God is eternal. So you can't ask the question, right? He's an eternal uncaused cause by definition. I wish I'd brought the ethics. It's the most amazing book. It's all proposition and explain. It's completely logical argument for hundreds and hundreds of pages. And they build on it. Like, you know, who does geometry here? You know, when you do a geometric proof, right? And you go step by step and they have to build on each other. The entire ethics is a geome geometric proof with thousands and thousands of steps that builds on itself. It's a real logic. It's beautiful. It doesn't mean it's right, but it's beautiful. So back to your question. I'll try and answer your question a little bit. Everything is caused. So we're not free. But this is kind of what Freud said. Anyone here into psychology? Right? You're going to do what you're going to do. You have your causal history, your genetics, your family background. You're not completely free. You can't determine yourself completely. But you can understand yourself better. Right? And for Spinoza, understanding, in one sense, would make you free. But in another sense, of course not. It's nothing's free. Everything is caused. So the idea is philosophy, like one might argue religion, helps you understand your place and who you are more adequately. That is a kind of freedom. Is it the freedom you want to go, I did it? No. But that's a baby freedom. That's not real. So freedom is understanding your place. And then the last thing, you asked about why would I want to do anything? That's not up to you. What does he say? The canatus. Everything strives. It's built into your nature. Right? The lion comes up to you. You don't go, whatever. What do you do? You run. That's nature. So why do you keep going? Why do you get up in the morning and go to class even though it's a boring class? Well, I don't want to get pissed on. I'm getting trouble. Right? No, 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 no. So you have some story. But you do. You strive. You persist. Yes. No, but it's, but it's okay. I would call it a, a, bear, a better sort of uh, synonym might be life force because it's, it's not, it's soul goes to heaven. We think we associate too much with religion and views that Spinoza would reject. So for him, it's more like God's energy. It is the energy in the universe. Just like there's thoughts in the universe and bodies in the universe, there's energy and power that God has, and modes have some small bit of that. We are made in God's image, yes? We have some of that striving of which God has in infinite measure. Okay. Okay. Well, Aristotle would agree with you. That's why I said the Christian definition of soul, depending on what kind of Islam you're talking about, is different than that. But... Aristotle's definition of soul and Spinoza's are very similar. So it depends. That's why I said for Spinoza, it's life force. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Yes, they do. They grow. They strive towards the sun and yeah. Yeah. Another question. Why did he put Theos on all of that and Socrates? Well, because the whole thing is God. The whole thing, everything is God. Why Socrates just up there? Why is it like Well, because, the, okay, yeah. This, Theos, and substance are the same thing. But the way that you understand this thing, which is this, you understand it like this. So it's like unpacking or opening a book and showing you what's inside. But it is just substance. And this is the drawing, you might say, a mapping of substance for Spinoza. Now, I'm late and behind schedule. Should I show movies? Dean is upset with me. Okay. So now I want to ask the question. We did all this history. Everyone got confused. We're talking about, what does this have to do? What was the title of the talk again? Technology, human nature, the 21st century. We haven't talked about any of that stuff. Maybe a little bit about human nature, but not exactly very scientifically. So we're going to conclude, maybe 15 minutes if you can be patient, talking about how thinking like Spinoza thinks might help us to think about technology and who we are and where we're going. And that's the dessert, okay? 
I find it very interesting that we're living in an age when it's reasonable to try and figure out how to teach a computer to recognize human emotions. Back to Rania. I mean, it doesn't seem weird to us anymore to talk about living non-human beings. We're starting to get comfortable with that idea. And I just think it's very cool. I'm going to try and get this next slide to work. That's the stuff I left out for you. I don't know if the video, the audio is probably good. The video might be. This is sort of like a segue to the next part. song, but since we're short on time, I'll spare you. One of my favorite artists, so I, I made the clip run longer than it too. Very interesting, though, that this is something that we're starting to recognize and struggling to get comfortable with. So I want to talk about a little bit of history closer to us from, you know, and, and the relationship between technology and human nature, and then I want to look forward. So first I want to talk about the printing press. You guys know where the printing press was invented? Anyone know? Germany, right? Um, in Gutenberg in 1450, Johannes Gutenberg invented it, and it displaced earlier traditions, thousands of years of people writing in, you know, with their hands. So a single Renaissance printing press could produce 3,600 pages a day. And as a result of the invention of the printing press, books of bestsellers such as Luther, Lutheranism, I don't know if you've heard of Lutheranism, it's a well, Luther, Martin Luther was the dude, uh, and Erasmus were sold by the hundreds of thousands in their lifetime, and printing spread from Germany to dozens of cities around Europe, and by 1500, printing presses in operation throughout Western Europe had already produced more than 20 million books, okay? So in 50 years, we went from being able to produce books one at a time to producing 20 million books, okay? Um, in the 16th century, with presses spreading further afield, the output rose tenfold to an estimated 150 to 200 million copies. And in 1620, the English philosopher Francis Bacon wrote that the single, the biggest single invention, right, it changed the whole face and state of the world. Okay, how does the printing press, what the heck does that have to do with Spinoza? Now, is the printing press a purely physical thing? Or is it mental? Or is there parallelism? Is there a mental and a physical component to what the printing press isn't about and how it's changed the world? Maybe we can imagine the change the printing press introduced in the following terms. Pre-press, ideas and words would move from one individual mind to another, maybe from your mouth, or to a few hundred other minds or ears. Or maybe ideas were written on a page by a single hand and read by the eyes of a few hundred or a few thousand people. Post-printing press, the ideas of one person or many people can, without, with the aid of technology, can be turned into printed words on millions of pages and read by the eyes and experienced as ideas by hundreds of thousands and later millions of people. So we can imagine the mind expanding as the physicality of thought expands, right? So there's this weird parallelism where these objects flow into the world in parallelism with the ideas. And this is a recurrent theme if you look at the history of technology and where technology is going. As weird as Spinoza sounds, the idea that everything that happens under the attribute of thought also happens under the attribute of extension. Ideas and bodies in parallel, constantly. This is the history of technology. And it's not just ideas, and it's not just bodies. It's parallel. So we can imagine the mind expanding as the physicality of thought expands through this book. Sounds like symmetry to me. Uh, the printing press is the object. Is it part of the human body? No. Is it an extension of the human body? 
like we use words, sound is an extension of the human body. And how do we think of the printing press? Is it part of our body? No, not exactly. But it allows us to do things that I used to do like this. Now I go like this in my conatus, my power, to create both things, words on a page, and ideas expands remarkably. Okay, another historical example. Medicine. Think of the history of medicine. There's a sense in which the human body is not what it was 500 years ago. And I mean this in physical and mental terms. We don't conceive of the body the way that people did back then. Um, and human bodies are very different than they used to be. Think of life expectancy. Think of how we deal with things. The underlying principle of most medieval medicine was Galen's theory of the humors, which I won't go into. But they believed that your, your physical health had to do with these different fluids in your body. Your bile, and depending on if your biles were your black bile and your green bile, if they were out of balance, you'd get sick. Green bile, lungs, <clears throat> my boab, right? So the history, phlegm, blood, this is how they understood the human body. If you were balanced, if, if you were out of balance, they used leeches. I don't know, did they do bloodletting in Egypt as a way if you were sick to cure you, to let the blood out, the bad blood, right? So... Now, much of this sounds pretty silly. I mean, most doctors, you know, I hope when I go to the hospital, they don't tell me to, you know, I'm gonna put some leeches on you, Dr. Bowditch, it'll make you feel much better. That's not how we think of the human body, right? We've mapped the human genome. We know the sequence of the chemical base pairs which make up human day, and we can map all of the genes in the human genome from a physical and functional standpoint. I can go to the AUC clinic and get antibiotics or even over-the-counter from my pharmacist, that would wipe out various bacteria and bacterial infections that would have killed me for sure a hundred years ago. Right? Cancer. Okay, it's still terrifying and dangerous, but we are slowly marching towards dealing with something. Same thing, we might even look in terms of AIDS. It used to be an instant death sentence, it's not anymore. Well, how should we, how'd this come to pass? What change the way that we think about the human body and we deal with the human body as an object? Well, by a parallel increase in our understanding of the human body, right, and our creation of technology to deal with it. Our conatus is expressed. So you might say that modern medicine has given us much more adequate idea of the human body. We used to have a more inadequate idea, in our idea and so therefore our power over the human body was limited. The less we understood about the human body, the less we could do to the physical thing. And as our understanding of the physical body changes, our power to persist and persevere expands. So science, and by the way, is a collective activity that we all do together, right? It's a global project, a world of adequate ideas. All scientists get together, whatever their religion, they don't worry about that when they're in the lab, do they? We're looking for truth. We're looking to expand our knowledge and control of, right, our conatus. All right. Now, yes? Well, because what's happened, if you look at the course of history, as technology has advanced, what we think we know in the mental world and what's happened in the physical world have changed and moved forward together in a parallel way. And Spinoza says, if something improves in the physical because the mind and the body are the same thing, of course it's gonna happen in the mental and vice versa. So brilliant ideas produce physical changes and physical changes affect how we think and they go, so they may be, it's, but as, so the history shows us how technology makes the mind and body more powerful together, moving forward, expanding what we can do. Yes, so, but also technology can be the printing press, right? Because it was, a, it was a tool. A hammer is a tool, is technology. How do you, try and hit a hammer in with your hand, a nail in. No good. Technology, good. Now I can build a house. Right? Technology gives us power. 
But technology requires ideas and bodies working together. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting point. This happens both ways. We have ideas that change how we build technology, and we have technology that creates new ideas that we never thought of. Think of the World Wide Web. Your mind isn't in your head anymore, is it? If I ask you a question, what are you going to do? Google it, baby. So there's a real sense in which your mind isn't in your head anymore. And your body isn't just this anymore, is it? My mother can turn on the heat in her house when she's in Italy to make sure it's warm when she gets home in Boston with her iPad. That's her body. That's her physical power. She changes things in the world. And that's the point I'm trying to make. So I will uh, close my talk with some video clips that I think speak to, that, that make my argument for me in ways that might, oftentimes one of the hardest things about philosophy is we only have words. We have some guy going blah, 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 and we have a book that's even harder to understand than me, right? So I'm going to end with some images that suggest an answer to what you're asking. What, is it, what do you mean when you say technology, power, and ideas? How do they fit together? Isn't it just a tool? Well, I'm not sure it's just a tool. I think it's working together. Yeah before I press play. Okay, there's a couple different questions. Yes, there's always the ethical questions involved with technology. And I'm not talking about those today, and I think they're really, really important. So I'm not dismissing them, but they're, that would take us to a whole nother lecture. What I'm interested in is the relationship between technology and knowledge. Okay, so that's what I want to focus on today. I'm not dismissing your question. So here's an interesting clip. Moving on to electrical interface, how do my bionic limbs communicate with my nervous system? Across my residual limb, Electrodes that measure the electrical pulse of my muscles, that's communicated to the bionic limb. So when I think about moving my phantom limb, the robot tracks those movement desires. This diagram shows fundamentally how the bionic limb is controlled. So we model the missing biological limb, and we've discovered what reflexes occurred, how the reflexes of the spinal cord are controlling the Terrible. muscles. Sorry. And that capability is embedded in the chips of the bionic limb. What we've done then is we modulate the sensitivity of the reflex, the modeled spinal reflex, with the neural signal. So when I relax my muscles in my residual limb, I get very little torque and power. But the more I fire my muscles, the more torque I get. And I can even run. And that was the first demonstration of a running gait under neural command. Feels great. We want to go a step further. We want to actually close the loop between the human and the bionic external limb. We're doing experiments where we're growing nerves, transected nerves, through channels or microchannel rays. On the other side of the channel, the nerve then attaches to cells, skin cells and muscle cells. In the channels of motor channels, we can sense how the person wishes to move. That can be sent out wirelessly to the bionic limb, and then sensors on the bionic limb can be converted to stimulations in adjacent channels, sensory channels. So when this is fully developed and for human use, persons like myself will not only have synthetic limbs that move like flesh and bone, but actually feel like flesh and bone. Okay, so again, this idea of technology being this object out there, Spinoza challenges, the, again, the relationship between the mind and the body. Similarly, all the people involved in this, this, these discussions of technology, we think of technology as an object out there that we use. But in fact, technology changes us just as much as we use it. 
And I think that's one of the things that Spinoza, thinking about Spinoza, helps you see. It's not a one-way street, Nate causing things to happen in the physical world. No, technology, the physical and the mental are always going back and forth, are always in parallel. Another example that is, I think, really funky, pardon the video. If there is Moving video. on to electrical interface, oh, how do my bionic limbs communicate with my nervous system? Let's see if this one works now. Technology. Should work. See what happens when I do that. Is that going to be the one we just watched? You can get your phone. I'm not making much headway right now. See what happens here. Looks like we're loading something. Or is it, is it frozen? Oh. Huh. Oh. Huh. Well, so anyone who knows how to use... I don't, I'm a Mac user. I don't know how to use it. Someone want to come up and save me? Oh, here he is. Yes, you have a question. Well, that's like saying I, I choose, I'm going to defy the laws of physics. Can you do that? But he doesn't think God makes choices either. That's right. I said this is a whole worldview. Everything is like physics. It's cause and effect. So all ideas are in God, all motions of all matter are in God, and they all follow cause and effect logical relations. And the more you understand the logic of God, the more blessed you are, right? So in certain ways, it sounds very familiar, like religious talk, right? And in other ways, it's it, because he takes it out of a religious context that we're familiar with, it sounds crazy. It's like physics turned into religion. In many ways. And that's why Spinoza is so useful to think about now. Because his philosophical view is ultimately, in many ways, more accurate, according to a physicist, than someone who believes that Jesus Christ came to save humanity, say. Right? I mean, from a physicist's standpoint, the reincarnation or other miracles... Technology is... No, the one before that? Inshallah, two, actually. He's, oh, he's good. We just got two more slides. Yes. Absolutely. From a human, we think we're free. Yeah, you think you're free. And there are ways that are not meaningless. So there are meaningful ways to say that you are, you have some small bit of freedom. But to say that you have the freedom that God has to do anything you want, I have power of free choice. I can determine who I am. No. Go talk to a physicist. Right? So, or go talk to a psychiatrist. Right? You don't determine who you are. Your parents do, and your genes do, and your history do, and your friends do, and where you grew up. Right? But are you completely a slave? No, Spinoza does have a story that says there's a sense in which you can be meaningfully free. But it's not the freedom you think you have. I'm so free, I'm self-determined, no. -uh. Yes? One way to, yes, this is, ex, this is excellent, but maybe this will be more helpful to answer your question. Thank you. One way to think of it is this. Only one being is absolutely unconstrained and uncontrolled by other things. God. Right? 
So you are, in one sense, a small part of God with a small bit of God's power and a God, bit of God's attribute of extension and a bit of God's thought. And you have a bit of God's causal power. <coughs> Excuse me. So are you affected by other things? Yes. Are you in total control? No. But do you affect other things? Are you, a, are you caused? Yes. But are you also a cause? Yes. So exactly. Yeah, so, so there's a sense in which when we think about the, our modern view, we want to say no. No one caused this but me, right? Therefore, I'm free. That's something we desperately want. I want to be completely responsible for who I am and what idea I do. But that's not possible, and it's not realistic, whether you think in terms of religion or you think in terms of physics or spinozistic philosophy. So are we ever going to get there? Come on up and do it. You're the man. Yeah. Individual freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Individually, it won't work. This is going to be again. Yes, in the back. Where does time fit in? Spinoza has an awesome view of time. And of course, um, what you would guess, I think, and tell me if I'm right. Insofar as we think about the world based on our limited, modal, individual, inadequate experience, right? Day-to-day -day life, time exists. But the more adequate your knowledge and understanding of God or nature, the more time drifts away. Because the truth, disconnected from where you're sitting and I'm sitting, the truth is eternal. So I think this is, again, a very religious... I mean, remember, he was training to be a rabbi. So there's a sense in which the more divine your knowledge, the more infinite and less time-bound, the less sequential, one after the... Right? So, yes, he has a story. He talks about the ultimate goal, the third kind of knowledge, which I didn't talk about today, is knowing outside of time, right? God isn't contained by time. Things don't happen to God in a sequence, right? At the most ultimate level. And that's true in religion, most Abraham, and it's true for Spinoza. But we experience time trapped in our world. Um, do I have it in a flash or a P? Yeah, some mumpkin here. I just want the last three slides, four slides. You guys are very patient, thank you. Of course this had to happen, and I didn't bring my adapter. I got someone over here who hasn't spoken, yes. Good, you're doing better than I if you're quick. What do you mean? I'm not sure what you mean. Yes, for human beings. Yes, we live our lives in the gray zone, in the messy, inadequate, sloppy, confused world of experience, mostly. Yes. Right, and I get, remember I said at some point, and a few people started nodding when I said, this is a, a metaphysical doctrine but it's ultimately political and ethical because when we have an adequate idea, you and I have exactly the same idea. We're not thinking with our bodies, right? Or the ideas that we have are not expressions of our physical condition with respect to each, right? And so that when we, the more that we share adequate ideas, the more in harmony we are. So there's a, yes, there's a political, ethical component to this. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I pointed to my psychologist friend in the background. 
I mean, it's not just physicists who tell us this. Freedom, when you go to a, a say, traditional Freudian psychotherapy, you get told at the beginning, well, all we're going to do is make you be able to live with the person you already are. We're not going to change you. In one fundamental sense, you're already who you are. What you need to do is have a relationship with yourself. And Spinoza says the same thing. Ultimately, he says, look, you're trapped in the causal chains of God's existence. Cause and effect and cause and effect, which is just what a physicist says. But your relationship to that, whether you understand your place inadequately, which means that you will be controlled and you will not be free, or adequately, in which case, yeah, you'll be caused, but you will be a cause, and most importantly, you will understand your place. And that's a kind of freedom. It's not the kind of freedom you want, but it's a real freedom, and it's the kind of freedom psychologists say maybe that's about as good as you're going to get. Yes. Yes. I, you, you want an honest answer? Okay, and one of the things you have to learn, and I hope you guys know this, and this is especially good for young Egyptian men to learn, I think. If you don't say, know something, don't claim that you do. Spinoza's third kind of knowledge, I spent maybe, I spent about a month thinking about how I could include it in my dissertation, right? Because I write about the first kind and the second time because I'm interested in Spinoza's conception of the emotions and which emotions are free, and which emotions give you power, and which emotions enslave you, right? And so I thought, well, I talk about the third kind of knowledge, maybe. I never figured it out. And I have read considerable primary and secondary literature, and I don't, I mean, it's basically um, where his philosophy becomes completely religious. And I, I just can't understand I mean, if you want to know, he says, seen from the, etern the perspective of eternity. Blessedness is seeing your place in the divine from the position of eternity. And it's a kind of knowledge that you, I don't, I mean, maybe metaphorically you could say it's the kind of knowledge that saints and prophets have, that most of us can't get close to, right? Yeah, we can't experience it personally. There occasionally are people that do. It's something you can aspire to. Should you try? Sure. Are you going to succeed? No. But if you do, maybe a prophet, maybe a saint. But understanding what that is, the, the content of that knowledge, that's like me, okay, well, I'm going to tell you what, you know, Jesus thought. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I don't know. Sorry. Yes, in the back. How can you what you're striving? You're striving? Yeah, what he says is, and again, this is kind of, you have to translate it into a language that works for you and makes sense for you. But he, he says everyone's got a striving. And the question is, when you're, you're that, that striving force that you have, what's, what are the ideas that it's participating in? What are the ideas that are guiding that striving? Is it jealousy? And is it being wanting what other people have and how you feel and that person did this to you or that person is really nice to you, I really like them or she's really cute or he's really handsome? No. So the idea is, okay, so he says that there's that world where your ideas enslave you and they weaken you. And what he argues, and again, it's a sort of religious message. There are other kinds of ideas that aren't connected to all that physical, day-to-day, self-absorbed crap, pardon my language, that will give you power, that will make you less vulnerable to other people, right? That will make you more autonomous, that will make you see your place more accurately, speaking in psychological terms, make you understand where you really are and not have your understanding be determined by other people. That's a kind of freedom to discover who I am, not through what other people tell me or show me who I am, but through my power, my adequate ideas. Almost all emotions enslave you because almost all the emotions that you have, say most forms of love, though not all forms of love, um, hatred, jealousy, um, most forms of physical desire, 
those are caused by something other than you. So they are given to you, forced on you by the outside world. They are not yours. So you are determined to have the feelings you have, not by you. And he calls that bondage. You are not in control. Back to this idea of your psychology. If the world around you determines your emotional life, oh, she's so creepy and mean, and meh, or whatever else. If those things are what determine how your parents think you should be living your future, right? If all that other stuff determines your emotional life, you are enslaved to it. But there are some ideas, right, that are, represent where you really are and who you really are. And when you have emotions caused by them, like the joy that he says comes along with the... He just says, look, when you feel, and it's almost religious for him, I think it's like... Um, a re religious experience, truth for Spinoza. Adequate ideas are like a religious experience. And they give you a kind of emotional joy. And you hear people when they talk about conversions or they talk about deep religious moments, right? There's an emotional component, not just an intellectual component or a component having to do with faith, where your whole person is transformed by, right? It's your, the, again, the parallel of the mental and the physical. I felt a euphoria. These feelings and sensations and ideas all simultaneously. I think we're gonna, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Basically what I like to say all the time about philosophy is on its own just thinking about itself, it can't do very much. Philosophy is kind of like a, a tool kit, a toolbox, right? And you take that toolbox and you say, okay, I want to think about this. So I'm going to use these tools, right? And I'm going to use these tools of ways of reading texts and the ways of thinking about problems and the ways of engaging with history and the ways of arguing with other people to try with that toolbox of skills that I learned, hopefully, to think about all different kinds of things. So in this talk, I tried to talk about, and the videos would have made it more interesting, the last few. Um, okay, things are corrupted, so they're working on it. They can't find external source of videos in the flash. Oh, well, they're in there. It's okay. So I think what I try and do, whenever I do philosophy talks like this that aren't very technical and we're not working in a class where we're going by a subject matter, is to try and show you how you could take something that we've all thought about and think about it in, from the angle of philosophy. So look back. You never thought of Spinoza, and there's this weird guy, Spinoza. It's kind of interesting. It kind of connects with some things that you can make sense of, kind of doesn't. And then we talk about, okay, technology, and we talk a little more about history, start thinking about the printing press, right? So I'm taking philosophical tools and history and to talk about technology and to show how the ideas all link together in ways that you never thought of. So I don't think there's, this is not a uh, masterpiece or a book that I'm going to write. It's an exercise. I could have done this. I teach sometimes, um, I teach bioethics, and it's philosophy talking about the ethics of medicine. Now, what does philosophy have to do with medicine? Nothing. Well, actually everything, right? Because if you have a patient in a hospital, there's a huge range of ethical issues that you have to deal with, with that person. And that toolbox that I talked about, that's another thing. Now, to understand the ethics of medicine, guess what you have to do? You have to do some history, it turns out. It's not something you do in a vacuum. You have to understand why people think in America say about abortion the way that they do. If you don't understand history in America, and you, don't, you can't do bioethics when it comes to women's rights and reproduction, period. So, and, but you also need critical skills. So that's the kind of exercise that I try and do. I, I promise, I know I never answer any questions. I just make more questions. And that's why philosophers like Spinoza and Socrates end up in trouble. Yeah, there's the other ones that I have are just insane if they work. Yeah. 
Well, okay, the next guy who's not going to be on here, if he shows up, great. But I'll tell you the story of the next guy. I'll try and do a good telling, okay? And then I'll come back to your question. The next guy was born colorblind, completely colorblind. Can you play it from here? Can you just play it from the screen? Completely colorblind. Yeah, just hit play. And everything, now complete colorblindness is different from other forms of colorblindness. Everything is gray, black, or white, right? So it's not like he's missing a few shades. So when he was 21 years old, he had a thing implanted in his skull on the back of his head that comes to the front of his head that takes colors and converts them into sounds on his skull and so that he can, not this one, the one before, two before actually, and he converts it into sound. So he can hear purple and green and he can, right? So he has, and he says that this is an example of technology changing human nature, right? And this was my idea. So we, did human nature change with the printing press? I think yes, actually. But we wouldn't say so. No, no, it's just books. Well, did human nature, has the history of medicine, has human nature changed? Maybe. Okay, it's the one after this one. Um, I think human nature has changed. We understand fundamentally who we are in the universe in a different way than we used to, right? Because of science. What I was showing with the future slides is, hey, alhamdulillah, yalla. Blindness. So... I've sure. never seen Life color, and I don't know what color looks like, because I come from a grayscale world. To, to me, the, the sky is always gray, flowers are always gray, and television is still in black and white. But since the age of 21, instead of seeing color, I can hear color. Uh, in 2003, I started a project with computer scientist don't Adam Montandon, and... The result, with further collaborations with Peter Keshe from Slovenia and Matthias Lizana from Barcelona, is this uh, electronic eye. It's a color sensor that detects the color frequency in front of me and sends this frequency to a chip installed at the back of my head and I hear the color in front of me through the bone, through bone conduction. So for example, if I have, if I have like This is the sound of purple. For example, this is the sound of grass. This is red, like Ted. This is the sound of a dirty sock, like, which is like yellow, this one. So I've been hearing color all the time for eight years, since 2004. So I find it completely normal now to hear color all the time. Um, at start, though, I had to memorize the, the names you give for each color, so I had to memorize the notes, but after some time, all this information became a perception. I didn't have to think about the notes, and after some time, this perception became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors, and I started to dream in color. So, uh, when I started to dream in color is when I felt that the software and my brain had united, because... In my dreams, it was my brain creating electronic sounds. It wasn't the software. So that's when I started to feel like a cyborg. It's when I started to feel that the cybernetic device was no longer a device. It, it had become a part of my body, an extension of my senses. And after some time, it even became a part of my official image. Um, this is my passport from 2004. You're not allowed to appear on UK passports with electronic equipment, but I insisted to the passport office that what they were seeing was actually a new part of my body, an extension of my brain, and they finally accepted me to appear with a passport for them. Okay. Can we do the next one, inshallah? So you get the idea now. The argument I was trying to make, right? That this, this distinction that we think of the human body as this, right, and ideas as this, Spinoza wants to say, no, 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 you misunderstand, right? Our mental world and physical world, are, we're constantly trying to expand our power of preservation. And this is an example of it. Um, this is a perfect example where the mental and physical, notice he says, oh yeah, my body, I started dreaming. So the distinction between the physical and mental, they're parallel. That, that evolution, you might say. Yeah. Conversely, um, and, and the gentleman over here mentioned that like, we have uh, technology in our hands that we didn't even know we were going to do it yet. Right. Then Google, for example, how, much, how many times does everyone on Google the same thing over and over again that you don't remember? Because you don't have to 
You don't have to store it anymore. You your, like I said, your mind is not in your head anymore. Well, this guy's mind is different, as is his body in parallel. Next one, can we go for it? It gets even weirder. I got to a point when I was able to perceive 360 colors, just like human vision. I was able to differentiate all the degrees of the color wheel, but then I just thought that this human vision was, wasn't good enough. It, there's many, many more colors around us that we cannot perceive, but that electronic eyes can perceive. So I decided to continue extending my color senses, and I added uh, infrared and I added ultraviolet to the color to sound scale. So now I can hear colors that the human eye cannot perceive. For example, uh, perceiving infrared is good because you can actually detect if there's movement detectors in a room. I can hear if someone points at me with a remote control. And uh, the good thing about perceiving ultraviolet is that you can hear if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. Because ultraviolet is a dangerous color, a color that can actually kill us. So I think we should all have this wish to perceive things that we, we cannot perceive. That's why two years ago I created the Cyborg Foundation, which is a foundation that tries to help people become a cyborg, tries to encourage people to extend their senses by using technology as part of the body. We should all think that knowledge comes from our senses, so if we extend our senses, we will consequently extend our knowledge. I think if we extend our senses, we will extend our knowledge. Oh, again, this, it's fine to get into the moral, and I wasn't talking about those issues. I'm not trivializing them, I'm serious. I mean, it's a whole range of questions about any of this has made our lives any better, have we made any progress as a species? I agree 100%. That wasn't the point I was making. I was sort of trying to show how doing some philosophy, looking at history, learning about this weird guy, thinking about our history and technology and the future, how that can be productive and useful conversation. I'm not trying to solve deep existential crises about the condition of humanity, but I agree. There's a whole range of questions about whether we're better, any off, better, you know, better off with this, but I won't try and do that today. One more movie, last one. This is the really big picture. He's not as interesting. He doesn't wear as interesting clothes as the other guy. But it's sort of a way to wrap this up. Go for it. Technology is accelerating evolution. It's accelerating the way in which we search for ideas. So, what, if, so if you have life hacking, life means hacking the game of survival, then evolution is a way to extend the game by changing the rules of the game. And what technology is really about is better ways to evolve. That is what we call an infinite game. That's the definition of an infinite game. A finite game is played to win, and an infinite game is played to keep playing. And I believe that technology is actually a cosmic force. The origins of technology was not in 1829, but was actually at the beginning of the Big Bang. And at that moment, the entire huge billions of stars in the universe were compressed. The entire universe was compressed into a little quantum dot. And it was so tight in there, there was no room for any difference at all. That's the definition. There was no temperature, there was no difference whatsoever. And at the Big Bang, what it expanded was the potential for difference. So as it expands, and as things expand, what we have is we have the potential for differences, diversity, options, choices, opportunities, possibilities, and freedoms. Those are all basically the same thing. And those are the things that technology bring us. That's what technology is bringing us. Choices, possibilities, freedoms. That's what it's about, is this expansion of room to make differences. And so a hammer, when we grab a hammer, that's what we're grabbing. And that's why we continue to grab technology, because we want those things. Those things are good. Differences, freedom, choices, possibilities. And each time we make a new opportunity place, we're allowing a platform to make new ones. And I think it's really important because if you can imagine Mozart before the technology of the piano was invented, what a loss to society that would be. Imagine Van Gogh being born before the technologies of cheap oil paints. Imagine Hitchcock before the technologies of film. Somewhere today, there are millions of young children being born whose technology of, of self-expression has not yet been invented. We have a moral obligation to invent technology so that every person on the globe has the potential to realize their true difference. We want a, a trillion zillion species of one individuals. 
That's what technology really wants. So that's the melodramatic ending, where this idea of technology being an expression of our kanatas, of our striving to know more and be more powerful, have more control, be a mode with greater causal power, right? As this way, and I think it's really cool. I mean, I think there are problems for the view that I've argued, and I would happily take people up with them, but I think the general suggestion that there is this striving that we have and that it's an opportunity. It's fraught with challenges and dangers, right? We can go wrong. But the idea that technology does give us kinds of power to expand both at the same time our body and our mind, I think that's something that Spinoza, you might say, anticipated. And now we're seeing it very obviously happen in our modern world. And it's going to be part of all of our lives as we move forward. And it's going to be amazing. And we're going to tell our children and our grandchildren, wow, you wouldn't believe what it was like back then. So thank you very much. I had a great time. I'm sorry it went so long, but I was just having too much fun. Oh, we have until 8? Oh. Oh, then I can answer questions. I thought I had to, Dina was like kicking me out. Sorry about that. I have to go till 8? Okay, good. Okay, any more questions now that I've just consumed? Well, that was kind of good. Uh, yes, back to you. It is a weird topic. Yeah, that's my job. Well, well, I don't know what I convinced you of. The only thing I want to convince you of is that things that we don't think about, you might say this is the job of a philosopher, to make the completely ordinary and uninteresting amazing. Because it turns out that almost everything around us if you think about it with that weird toolkit that I told you about, turns out to be really complicated. Like, the, how do I know I'm sitting here right now? What a stupid question. Guess what? How many gallons of ink and thousands and millions of pages, and we still don't really know the answer for sure, right? So, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes, I haven't talked to you yet. How can it expand our mind? Bodies. Our bodies. Well, again, think of it this way. I had a friend, um, when I first came to AUC in 2006, one of the guys who was in the department who's left, who's now at Sarah Lawrence, he was a good friend of mine. We used to talk all the time. I'll get to you. So I said, dude, so like, what does he mean, Spinoza, when he says like, the technology expands your body? Good question. So I asked the same question you did. And he said, airplanes, man. I was like, what? What do you mean airplanes? But think about it. In a sense, our capacity to figure out how to build an object that can leave the Earth with 300 people in it and fly across an ocean at hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour, is that an expansion of my body? Yeah. yeah. In one sense. It's not what you think of, you know, in the way that growing your nails longer is an expansion of your body. No, no. But again, Spinoza's going to say, well, ideas, where's your mind? Is it in your head? Yeah, of course, in one sense. But in another sense, it's out in the internet, it is in Facebook, it's in Twitter, right? It's out there. Similarly, your body. Hmm? Yeah, maybe. But I do think, I mean, yes, and I think, though, the idea is, again, I said about my mother turning on the heat in the house. That's technology. Does it expand her body, her power, to affect the world with her body? Well, wait, she can sit there in Italy and think about turning on the heat all she wants. Without the technology, it's not going to happen. She needs the technology. You can think about flying to America by flapping your arms. Trust me, you need an airplane. So the technology, it's not literally connected to you. But when you use it, is it an extension of your body? Kind of, right? I'm, when I sit in an airplane seat, I often think of Spinoza and get weirded out. Because I'm now, in a sense, this is part of who I, it's allowing me, this technology is allowing me to do something physical I couldn't do without it. Yeah. Just, just a thought. Uh, you were patient. What do you mean the quality of technology and humans? The cost of technology? The cost, not price. I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean... If we're getting back to this gentleman's questions about does all this technology and the investment we make in it and what we get out of it improve our lives? 
I think Spinoza would say, well, of course, just like your own human body, if what you get out of that technology is a bunch of inadequate ideas, like most of what's on your Facebook, well, then it doesn't improve your life. But at the same time, just like with your body and the ideas that you have, that technology, if used to give you adequate knowledge and more power, could. So I think it's a matter of the intention and how you use it. Yes, and then I'll get to you. It, uh, into two uh, sections. Uh, techno, it is the application, and logic, it is a science. So we must use it. Uh, like it is the usage. Is, uh, we must use it in, in, in any field, in any branch of, uh, of science. Technology, we have to use in all. Yeah. Yeah. Techno, it is application. Yeah. And the second question is for me. Okay. Archaeology? Yes. Awesome. My school. Good job. Uh, what is meant by the science philosophy? And uh, why, as uh, I'm a student, I'm, I'm preparing now for post-study uh, post studies and so on, why I'm, uh, I must uh, study the philosophy and the relationship between the philosophy and the science like Excellent question. Okay, so this is a question I get. I teach a class called Philosophical Thinking, which every AUC student has to take in their first three or four semesters. And it's a philosophy class. And as you all know, most students that come to AUC and spend all that money do not want to take philosophy classes. Back to our earlier discussion. This is not what I came here. I want to go Hundas, thank you very much, not Magnun. So I think the point the reason that we make students take philosophical thinking, and it's your question as well, and this is why philosophers, why scientists need to understand philosophy of science, is that the doing of the specific thing, medicine, or archaeology, or physics, that's an activity that you engage in. What the philosopher does is say, wait, let me think outside of the details of the activity about the concepts, the fundamental beliefs that scientists never question. The stuff right in front of scientists they never ask about. They just take it to be true and they go on and do experiments. Khalas, right? Move ahead. Make progress. The philosopher is the one who doesn't have anything but the toolkit. Who says, wait a minute. When you're saying you've just proven something, sir, what does proven mean? Well, I did. You know, I proved it. I got the, I got the result I wanted with the lab. But, Excuse me, sir, says the philosopher. Can you explain, though, what you've just said is you've gotten a result. What does that result actually prove? Well, uh, you know, it, it proved... It. No, I don't know, actually. Because, and then we look at history. Oh, remember that time we thought we'd proven that, you know, the sun goes around the earth? Everyone knows that. What are you, stupid? Do you think we go around the sun? They were sure, they knew that the sun was going around the earth for thousands and thousands of years. And now we laugh at them. So what the scientist, what the philosopher brings to archaeology and to physics, I have a friend who does philosophy of physics. He's not a physicist. He does philosophy of physics. How can you get a good job doing philosophy? Because physicists don't think about the questions around physics. They just think about doing physics. But you can't do good physics without understanding the questions around physics. So that's why we also make all those AUC students come and take a philosophy class. And almost all of them say thank you to me when they graduate. Yes, sir. Oh, wait, wait, no, I, actually, there was a person back in yellow. Thank you. Sorry. I'd like first to, uh, to thank you for this nice presentation. And uh, actually, I have background about uh, philosophy and technology. So that's why I was so interested in today's lecture or uh, session. Okay, good. Uh, now, now comes the hard part. Now she's going to ask the hard question. Yeah. Please do. Okay. Actually, um, something I have learned before about uh, perception can't be based upon um, senses. Right. Uh, because the doctor, uh, she once told us that uh, animals, cats, whatever, they can depend upon their, like bats, they can uh, depend upon their senses, which super, you know, uh, surpasses human senses. The power, you know, 
And the second question is about uh, my mom's comment. She always, <laughs> she always tells us that calculators spoils our mind, that uh, we used to um, use calculators and uh, we don't depend upon our minds anymore, which, you know, um, make the power less. Yes. Yeah. That's no, I think I this is, the, you, okay. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. This is a good, um, I'll ask the, I'll answer the second point first. It's back to the question, I think. There remains a question that's unanswered about whether all of this technology rep represents progress, right? Whether we're any better off, right? Your mom says, great, now you have a calculator, but you don't know how to do long division, right? How lame is that? We could all do long division. We know how to use a slide rule. Who knows how to use a slide rule, right? Right? Yeah, no more. It's, but it used to be essential. You couldn't have a job without it. It was, it was the fact, baby. That was like, and so is it better or worse? I don't know. But I do think it's fair to say that if you want to make progress in mathematics or more practically in applied sciences, if you decide you want to do your calculations with a calculator. So, yes, I think we need to resist complacency. I think we need to resist saying, I don't have to do it, the technology does it. I'm, or I'm not responsible, it's the technology that's responsible. We have to resist that. At the same time, I do think your mom, you know, what would you, well, it used to be really nice to take the Queen Elizabeth II across the Atlantic. Okay, that's true, but I need to get there for a meeting in New York. Is it better or is it worse? I think the ethical question is gonna hang there. What was your first question? You asked it about, oh, okay. Spinoza, like most philosophers, and as your doctor said, believes that what we get from our senses is only uh, one way of engaging with reality. So Plato was most famous, probably if you guys think of who, those of you who have read Plato and the story, the allegory of the cave. Who knows about the cave story of Plato's? Yeah, right? And in the story of the cave, right, he says it's a metaphor for our lives as human beings. When we're in the cave, we think we're free. Back to the idea that you thought you were free, right? And, but what you are in the cave, it turns out, is that you're chained in a chair. And you're inside sort of like a movie theater that's created by a fire. And the fire is behind a wall. And on the wall are these people with cut out figures that cast shadows. And so you see the shadows and you think that's real. And so for Plato or for Spinoza, that is the world of living with your eyes and with your body. You don't see what's really there. And what the philosopher pushes us all to do, and this is again a very religious image of a spiritual ascent from the darkness of the cave where we live by the flesh, out of the cave. Notice the cave is down, it's an ascent. Again, religious metaphor. What do you come to? The light. You see the truth, right? God, understanding. So. I think this idea in, in philosophy, it's a long, long standing view. Now, there are other people, like my hero, a guy I'm working on named David Hume, who just think that's all crazy. Who just thinks, look, all you got's what you get from your senses, right? So, this is a long standing debate, and I can't even begin to but this is a perfect example of how the most obvious, boring thing in the world are you sitting there? Looks like it. My senses tell me you are. Am I seeing you as he sees you? Well, you look at her. Does it look the same? How do I know whether he's seeing the same thing I do? I mean, maybe what I see is white, he sees is black, but he calls it white because he sees, that's what he calls black-looking things because that's what he's called. Uh, the most obvious thing. And that's the, you know, that's philosophy's job, to stir up, to bother, to confuse. But that's productive. We don't do that enough in our lives. Right? And that's why we force AUC students to do this. And that's why I think you guys are all brave to come out and sit in the hot room for two hours and get confused. It's, in, it's good for you. Is, is that a question in the back? Awesome. Go for it. Thank you. It's not actually the right um, a way to uh, in increase our, our knowledge. Uh, actually, I think um, um, I'm, I'm a biophysicist. Um, actually, um, there is, um, after my study, I, um, I suddenly uh, uh, happened to see that um, many uh, physical meanings that uh, men, men ha have to uh, um, put it in uh, as physics 
actually were not exactly like, like that, like color, or like heat. Uh, actually, he did uh, call it that way because he is a human. He is right. a human being. He's a, th a thinking human being. He, right. This containment, this confinement of, of uh, biology uh, that makes you uh, say there is a color and there is a, a, a heat. Actually, physically, physically speaking, a color is um, uh, actually an um, electromagnetic wave. Just a wavelength, yeah. Of, of course. It's just a uh, uh, little spectrum of the uh, uh, mm -hmm. large spectrum of electromagnetic wave. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm working in um, the field of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think this is really the, the thing that may take us out of this uh, uh, trap uh, we are entrapped in, um, to make um, us see the world in a way that we have never uh, been able to see with our... Uh, Can I ask you a question, though? Of course. It's awesome. Of course. But isn't AI going to have parallel, back to Spinoza, Advances that are physical, technological advances, and advances that are mental, advances in the world of ideas, right? Yes. So I'm agreeing. I think you, AI is a kind of technology for Spinoza. Of course. So you're absolutely right. If you don't think these particular examples of technology are good, are the best examples for understanding how, what it would mean for technology to expand human nature, like yes. AI would maybe. Yes, of course. I mean, who's, was it the movie She or Her? I never remember which. Her? That's a great example, right? What does it mean to be a person? One of the things he discovers is that she's having a relationship with 4,300 other people, just like that one that he thought was exclusive. Is she bad? Eh, don't think so. She's sincere. She means it. She loves him. Right? W was she a person? Ah, I don't know what to say. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm agreeing with you. I, I think you're... What you say is right. It's a, another kind of example where technology, the, the physical and the mental, will expand our idea of what it means to be a person. Actually, I think the, the idea or the notion uh, that they are trying to um, uh, make it through uh, the uh, mind uploading, I think, uh, of course, you have um, heard about. Um, I think this would be a very fantastic thing to happen, um, very um, um, uh, inspiring. You're much, I'm more old fashioned than you. I still want my body. I, you know, Thank you. I like hugging my children. They're really cute. My wife is beautiful. So, but go for it. Upload. Uh, I'll try. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Are we done? It's eight. Okay. One more question, then we'll be done. He was patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's an interesting question, right? There's two ways to react to the fear that technology is going to take over and, and affect human nature. One way is to say, yeah, so let's embrace it and put all the technology we possibly can so that we start seeing ultraviolet colors and we start being able to do all these. And the other, it, which we've also seen plenty of times, is it's going to take over. So throw away your smartphone. Get rid of YouTube and get rid of your Facebook account and don't tweet and get a stupid phone. Not as right... Don't let my kid watch TV. Don't let my kid on the internet. You know? So I think, yeah, that's a struggle. And this is, again, back to your earlier question. When you engage all these interesting technological questions about human nature, and this is very, I'll close with the thing Dina was talking about, what I end up finding most intriguing is the questions you ask. I start with something about emotions, and I end up talking about something about why does it matter? What's its moral significance? What does it say about us, right? And I think all the questions about technology and the relation between the body and the mind and all that end up getting very quickly into ethical, moral, religious, spiritual questions that are also really cool. And that's why philosophy, you open one door, you ask one silly question, you spend an hour looking at kind of weird videos and, and excerpts from this old dead guy, and then you're actually, you've got something to work on, to chew on. Besides another television show. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly.
Exactly. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so we have to be done. Thank you, guys. I had a super yeah. fun time. It was really wonderful. I you want guys to are thank great. Him. Please thank him. Yes. And if you thank have you. questions, I'll stay up here. Yeah. And Dr. Nate said he's willing to have a few questions when you. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you can okay. go home and you don't have to be polite. Anymore. Thank you. Thank you guys very much.